So first of all, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Eric Johnson. I'm a product manager for Ruben Networks. Um, my portfolio responsibilities include the outdoor access points uh, that Aruba produces, and I have general radio responsibilities. Um, I'm the designated RF geek on the, uh, the product management team at Aruba. Um, I've been doing wireless for uh, 27 years now. Uh, an antenna engineer for seven years. I worked for Nortel as a base station architect for a period of six and a half years. I uh, worked for Bel Air Networks as uh, dri driving their international sales engineering team. So I've done your job, I've hung gear, I've installed gear, I've tested it. Um, and I've been at Aruba now for three and a half years and, uh, and took over their outdoor portfolio and have been driving the next, uh, next generation solutions. So one of the things, uh, one of the reasons I do these sessions is I'm pretty much fundamentally irritated with the way that um, RF is taught. Um, the subject matter that you guys are dealing with now with 11N, with 11AC, with beamforming, with multi-user MIMO is grossly misunderstood in this industry. Um, if you guys go looking for multi-user MIMO or 11AC papers on beamforming, you're gonna get a whole lot of jargon and a whole bunch of really scary math. Um, so this is an attempt to, to break this down and make it a little bit more digestible. It's still a hard slog. Um, so please ask questions as we go along. You know, we got an hour. If I don't get through the session, that's fine, as long as you guys get out of this what, uh, what is valuable to you. Um, there are a lot of myths, and we're going to be talking about some of those as we go through this material. Okay, so we're going to start off, uh, should be fairly lightweight. We're going to talk about antennas, uh, spend a minute or two on polarization, which is important for the outdoor side of the business. Um, what is beamforming exactly, and what can you do with it? Uh, orthogonal patterns, that's a really important concept. And uh, we're gonna talk about that in terms of what it means. And then we're gonna take that information and hopefully guide you guys through what 11AC beamforming and multi-user MIMO is. All right. So this should be familiar to all of you. This is an antenna pattern. Um, one of the most common misconceptions is that antenna patterns encompass distance information. They do not. There is absolutely no distance information in an antenna pattern. You can't actually tell what's gonna happen uh, at a particular distance until you include an additional item, which I'll talk about in a minute. So, typical terms, you have the azimuth or the horizontal pattern, so this is an omni. So you have a nice round omnidirectional pattern on, on the horizontal. And then the elevation or the vertical plane, this is where you see traditional side lobes, you see the 3dB points, which is where the power is rolled off 3dB. It is very important to note, the antenna does not stop radiating at the 3dB points. Okay, I can't tell you how many times I've had to talk to customers, well, it's a 60 degree antenna, and I need to go to 63 degrees. Well, great, use that antenna, because it's rolled off an additional two tenths of a dB. You got a lot of useful coverage. It's really important, particularly for the jobs you guys do, to understand the three dimensional impacts of what these patterns are telling you. Okay, same thing for directional antennas. You got a couple of more terms that get thrown around. Uh, the front to back ratio, which is simply the amount of energy going forwards versus the amount of energy going backwards. Again, we've got side lobes in the 3dB points. And one of the things that you can do is if you have both of those antenna patterns, you can actually uh, approximate what the three dimensional looks like by multiplying the two of them together. Most antennas are considered variable separable, so their X and Y planes can actually be multiplied together to give you the composite antenna pattern. So that's called a radiation solid on the bottom. All right, so now I mentioned to you that um, antenna patterns do not include distance. Now I'm gonna show you how distance can be included when you're dealing with antennas. Okay, so on the left-hand side here, those are measured patterns which are you know, messy in real life. So I created an emulation of that for the, for the simulations you're gonna see here. You can see the side lobe structures are roughly the same power level. The beam widths are the same. So, that's the, I incorpor so it's important to capture the sort of the important components when you're doing a simulation. Now. We can take that pattern. The missing piece of information to give you distance is you need to know what your install height is. Okay, once you know your install height, you can use those funny cosine, tangent, and, and uh, sine buttons on your calculator um, and actually work out what the distances are that correlates to the pattern. So one of the things you should immediately notice here is that, okay, with an install height of, of uh, 20 meters, when you're 20 meters out, you're at the 45 degree point. When you're 100 to 200 meters out, you're in that last five or 10 degrees. 80% of your coverage is actually in that portion of the antenna pattern. Okay, so it's really important to understand that because I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people expecting Omnis to have a hole underneath them. They do not. Because one of the things is, is that your 
standing directly underneath the antenna and you only got the height of install versus 200 meters, that means you've got a factor of 10 in there. So the antenna pattern can be 20 dB less and you'll have exactly the same amount of power straight down as you have at 200 meters straight out. Okay, so, so it's really important to understand how these map onto your physical ground coverage. Okay, so that's how it works in, in a, a, simple, a simple plan view. What happens now if we actually do this over a, a two-dimensional area? So the plots I'm gonna show you are both 100 meters by 100 meters and 1,000 meters by 1,000 meters, so roughly 300 feet and 3,000 feet. They're flat earth, so there's no instructions or anything like that, and I'm assuming I got a zero dBi client antenna at the far end, and propagation effects, this is all R squared propagation in the, in the model. Okay, so if you put the antenna in at five meters, there's the side lobe structures. You can see them on the, on the close in plot, that's the 100 by 100. You can see all those little ripples in there. It doesn't go to zero anywhere, um, but you do have the ripples and you, the, the side lobe structures do impair you close in. Over the larger plot, remember most of your coverage is actually in that last few degrees of the antenna pattern. And that's what you see at, at 1,000 meters. This whole area is compressed down to the dot in the middle. Now, what happens if I increase the height? Well, all of those relative distances double because it's similar triangles. Oops, sorry. Okay, so there's 10 meters. The ripples are now further apart. The center section on the large, the large plot is starting to increase. But you'll notice that the power at the edge of coverage is almost exactly the same. It's gone from minus 72 2.8 to minus 73. Let's take it to 20 meters. Again, the power level at the edge of coverage is dropped by one dB because you're starting to come off of the main beam. Your ripples are becoming a little bit more important. You, w you probably won't ever see those because the adjacent areas are gonna give you a bounce anyway. This doesn't include bounces. Right, so and then now you can see that in the, in the larger plot, because your, your geometry is all increasing as you increase the height, you can now actually see some of the side lobes starting to manifest in the downstream or the downrange information. And at four, at, sorry, at, at 20 meters, and if you extended this further, you'd actually get out of the main beam. So the, the um, then your power level would start to drop precipitously. But so that's why it's important to make sure you understand how that pattern translates to the ground. Any questions on that? That should be fairly straightforward. Okay. Polarization. So, um, at Aruba, all of our outdoor access points use do at least du dual polarization or triple polarization antennas. Triple polarization is kind of a misnomer because there are only two. You get horizontal and vertical. You can stick one in the middle and call it another polarization, but it's actually a combination of horizontal and vertical. Indoors, generally we don't use polarization. And the reason is, is that your environment, every time you bounce off of a surface, it spins the polarization, okay? Because it's the angle of arrival, and then you, you get partial, you'll get funny reflections off the walls, it will actually change the polarization on every bounce. So you actually get rich polarization mixing in indoor environments, particularly in a room like this or in a conference space. It might be useful to have more polarization diversity when you're in a large space, because then, you, then it can be more important. But when you're, when you're outdoors, of course, it's the only way that you can actually separate the two channels in an open environment. So these are showing uh, some of the five dBi omnis that, uh, that we have on our products. So one of them is a vertical and one of them is a horizontal. And you can see what happens if we use two verticals versus a horizontal and a vertical antenna. So downrange, um, the, the diversity benefit that we see associated with the, the extra polarization makes a pretty profound difference in performance. All right, and I can do the same thing with, with, with higher gain on these. You're seeing some interactions here. Some of that may be due to side lobes, but again, in general, we see a significant improvement in throughput and stability of throughput uh, as you increase the range by using that polarization outdoors. Now, is this applicable only to Aruba products? The answer is no. Um, this is a competitive product. And uh, what we did was we, we strapped, uh, we used our antennas on it and we had three verticals, which is the bottom line, which is by the way, what that vendor does as a baseline. The top line is simply taking one of those vertical antennas and having VVH. Kind of an important performance difference. Okay, polarization outdoors is a massive advantage. You should never ever deploy single polarization antennas outdoors because you're gonna be throwing away massive amounts of performance and stability in your links. Any questions on that? Okay, good, we're getting through this. Now we're gonna talk about basic beam forming. Chuck. Back up to? Yep. Is 
part of the difference there that uh, you're getting different stream? Sorry, is part of the difference that you're getting different spatial stream rates? Yes, so, so that's, what, that's what we think is going on uh, in most of these situations. Um, most most multi-stream devices, um, most of the handset guys actually have this figured out if the AP vendors don't. Uh, they generally will deploy inside of your laptop, for example, on the side of your laptop, there's one antenna there, there's another one across the top. So they inherently have polarization diversity built into their client devices. We also see the same thing on the S5. The antennas are this way and this way in the S5. So that helps to line that up as well. And I'm gonna show you how, how MIMO uh, actually factors in with polarization because some people have the impression that, oh wow, okay, I've got these antennas that are vertical, horizontal, what happens if they're this way? I'm gonna show you what happens in that case and I'm gonna show you why, why it doesn't matter. Okay, so great question, thank you Chuck. Um, okay, so all of you know that if you take a piece of wire and you move an electron up and down, you radiate. Simple as that, that's how radiation works. Um, so in the case of a simple wire, it radiates in a circle because there's nothing, it's all uniform in, in every direction. And so you get an omnidirectional characteristic in the plane perpendicular to the wire. Now what happens if I put two of those elements in and I excite them in phase and I put them a half wavelength apart? So quarter, half wavelengths are important numbers in, in RF as you guys know. Um, what you see here is you get reinforcement up and down because they're in phase. And side to side, they actually cancel because the half wavelength, when that, the left antenna radiates to the right antenna, it actually will cancel. So you get a big null in, in the left and right directions. Okay, but that's actually the simplest form of beam forming. I just created a beam, right? I'm forming a beam using, using elements. If I extend that to four, I get significant reinforcement up and down. You can actually see that I get some secondary reinforcement out to the corners, which is where it's causing those side lobes in the pattern but I still have a nice big null on the side. Okay, so this is great. So this is really simple. I've got four, four elements in a line. I'm excited them all in phase, and it gives me that. Well, what happens if I don't like those side lobes? What can I do about that? Well, first of all, there's something called a binomial array, and by, by doing this, okay, all four elements are still going at the same time, but we're changing the amplitude. So instead of being one, 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 now the center two are excited much more strongly, so it's one, three, three, one. You guys can look this up on the internet, it's called a binomial array. Um, and what that does is by altering the amplitude, I can actually eliminate the side lobes. Okay, because I've got rid of that secondary reinforcement by applying the amplitude math. All right, so I've gone from that to that. Now of course nothing comes for free. You'll see that the main beam here is narrower than this one because I had to, I had to sort of put a curve on the amplitude, so that actually gives me, it spreads out the energy on the antenna pattern but I got rid of the side lobes. So that's, that's an example of amplitude only beam forming. All right, now what happens if I take this, this, this antenna and I put a phase slope on it? So now what I have is the one on the, on the right hand side is starting a little bit earlier than each of its neighbors. So that it creates a wave front that actually radiates away from the front, the, the top of that. So th this one's going first, then this one, then this one. So I get a phase slope and the antenna goes in the direction of the slope. So I end up with a tilted antenna pattern. And it's all, one, one, it's all equal amplitude, so this is phase only beam forming. Okay, I've shifted the antenna pattern by, by introducing phase. So is this, is this news, news to anybody? Or is this all something you guys all know because you're all a room full of experts? Excellent, okay, good. So at least one person's learned something, that's good. All right, so, so this is really it, guys. This has been with us since World War II. Okay, they started introducing phased arrays on military, military ships uh, during the war, and they started doing this with radars to scan them back and forth. Really, really ancient technology. Nothing new here, the math is actually fairly straightforward. Now there's a concept called orthogonal patterns. Given a, an array of elements, so in this case I'm gonna show it to you for a different number, you can create what are called orthogonal patterns. An orthogonal pattern is where your peak and the nulls line up on the, on the patterns that you can create. So by exciting the two elements in phase, you get the blue curve, which is the original plot I showed you. And if, then if you put them zero and 180 degrees, you get the red curve. And those two, those two antenna patterns are considered orthogonal. All right, that's what it means. At the peak of the blue, I have a zero on the red and vice versa. Now this is a really important concept because this means that you can null out the energy being radiated. You can have two antennas 
And if you have one user straight up and one user out to the side, you can actually put di completely different streams of information out to those two locations, and they'll be completely isolated from one another. Hey, that sounds a lot like multi-user MIMO. So that's pretty cool. You can do the same thing with three elements. Again, now we've got, mul we've got two, or sorry, three orthogonal patterns. You can do it with four elements. You've got four orthogonal patterns. The top and bottom are mirror images because these are omnis. And you can do it with eight. I've only plotted part of them here because this is really busy. But you can actually see that there's a series of orthogonal patterns. And, and theoretically, if you're in a completely open environment with no inflections, you can have a user sitting at the peaks of each of those and they can all get their own independent uh, data stream. So that is eight stream MIMO, which is all going to eight different users. Right? So this is pretty basic. But of course, we don't live in a world without obstructions. There's things like walls and ceilings and floors and windows. So this looks great in theory, but, and this is some of the treatments you'll see if you go reading this stuff. This actually has the patterns that are, are really used, they ain't pretty. So I'm gonna show you what's going on with that. Okay, and this is another case where I've got now a triangular arrangement. And I only get two orthogonal patterns in that case um, because the blue is radiating three directions and the, the, the brown is radiating three directions. So I can only put two independent users on those. All right, 11 AC beam forming. Some really important things to think about. First of all, it works with all clients to support 11 AC beam forming function, right? Now, historically, this is a little bit dated now. The first cycle we had with, with the 11 AC stuff was the Broadcom chipsets. Qualcomm did not do beam forming in their first generation we, we, uh, 11 AC stuff. They're catching up now, and, and as we go into wave two, everyone's gonna be doing beam forming. So this is a technology that is absolutely here to stay. The standards body finally got it right. With 11N, they screwed it up. They created three different ways to do it, and they made them all optional. In standard speak, that is a way to make sure that it never, ever happens. Okay, 11AC, they did it one way. They said this is the only way that it will be done. And as a result, we're now seeing broad adoption because this always works. It always provides a benefit, okay? Um, but it's actually, the other thing I'm gonna mention here, 11AC beamforming is actually a really lousy name for this. It should have been called MIMO optimization, or it should have been called channel optimization. And when I'm talking about channel, I'm not talking 20, 40, or 80 megahertz. What I'm talking about is this room is the propagation channel. Everything in here, including your bodies, the walls, the ceilings, the, you know, the floor, that's the propagation channel. 11AC beamforming is incredibly powerful because it takes into account everything from the baseband not the RF, but the actual baseband in the access point to the baseband in the client. That means that all of the analog distortions, any weirdness you get off your power amplifiers, if you have a differential path length on your receiver chain versus your transmitter, all of that stuff is completely calibrated out of the system. And it's done 40 times a second, okay? It knows exactly where you are from a mathematical representation of this room every 40 milliseconds, or yeah, every 40 milliseconds, sorry, every, every 25 milliseconds, 40 times a second. That's really cool. No guessing, you don't have to build up an estimate. There's none of that stuff. Sends a sounding packet, the client responds, I know that you are there, okay? And then when my packet goes, I'm gonna beamform perfectly to that location. Well, up to the accuracy of the channel estimate, but that's a little bit too much detail. 11AC beamforming is standards-based. That's incredibly important. <laughs> Thousands of people have contributed to this process. When, when 11, 8 to 11 started, it was actually a pretty small team. 8 to 11N and 11AC, this is big business now. There are lots of people at these sessions, and there are lots of academic papers that get written, and they're all contributions, they're all reviewed. And this then means that this is the consensus view of a bunch of really smart people. If they thought doing an analog beamforming solution would be the right way to do it, that's what they would have standardized. They didn't. 11AC beamforming, as I mentioned, is done in the baseband, and it actively tracks the users. Okay, so the simple, the overhead, the, the cost associated with this, because again, nothing comes for free in this space, we do have to send sounding frames to do this. Okay, so a sounding frame has coded information on it, it knows if it's talking to a one, two, or three stream client, it will send the appropriate information, um, for when it sends out that sounding packet, the beamformee or the client device, and because this can run in the other direction as well, you can actually have beamforming from the client back to the AP. Um, the, the sounding frame sent, the, the, the client device says, okay, this is how I hear the different antennas coming off of the access point. 
I'm going to compress that information, send it back, and now, I, now the AP knows exactly where he is from a mathematical perspective, and it starts sending the beamformed frames. All right, so that's what it looks like, and I'm sure you guys have seen that picture before, courtesy of Peter. Um, this is what's actually going on. Now, if you guys go digging on papers, you're going to see this magic matrix show up. And usually the papers start there and they go down. <laughs> um, so this is, I'm going to try to help you guys understand what's actually going on here. So first of all, the, the, the algebraic expression here is, is Y, which is the output on the receiver side, is the channel transform, so this room, times the inputs, which is the antennas on the access point. Okay, That's what it's actually saying. And I'm going to show you graphically how this works. But basically, the terms, so you have H11, H21, and H31 um, on the client, those are what's received at Y1, Y2, Y3. Those are the client antennas. Those are what are received on the client from the antenna number one on the AP. Okay, you repeat that process again, and you build this arrangement. That is called the channel estimate. Okay, then the client says, okay, great, I know what the channel estimate is. I'm gonna cram that down together, ram, ram it back to the AP. Now, I can generate the inverse of that. And if you remember your algebra math, I'm sure most of you have forgotten more than you remember, um, but when you run, it, when you run the, the inverse through, what you get is the inverse times the, uh, yeah, sorry, the inverse gives you back the original, the original signal. So you can actually take that and multiply it out and you'll actually be able to do your beamforming from that. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Now, for those of you who have never thought about how the fields work, have you guys ever sat in a, in a car listening to a weak FM signal? Say you're sitting at a light and you let your car roll forward slowly, you can actually hear it increasing and decreasing in amplitude. It gets better and then it gets worse. That's what's going on. The same thing's happening in this room. And it's happening in a two-dimensional way. I've just shown one plot here, but it happens in every location in this room. There's peaks and valleys everywhere. All right, and so what the client's doing is it's sampling what it hears, because the, the sounding frame is encoded. Um, so the client's actually able to figure out, well, and this is what I'm hearing from each of the antennas from the AP, and can segregate those and build that matrix. Sends it back, and then you can multiply that inverse times the, the feeds of the, th the three streams on the AP, and you'll now get beam-formed signals coming out of the access point. So that means that all three antennas now, where originally you had stream one coming out of antenna one, stream two coming out of antenna two, and stream three coming out of antenna three, now they are spatially multiplexed, which is where those terms come from. Stream one is across all three antennas with amplitudes and phases. Stream two and stream three are all the same. And of course, this extends to four, five, or eight antennas. The math is the same, but three is, uh, three is not, not too bad to look at. All right, now, how does this manifest in reality? So first of all, I'm going to show you what happens with polarization. And this is actually a, a, simple, a simple way. So at the source end, you have a vertical and a horizontal signal. And at the receiver, you have exactly the same antenna, but it's turned 45 degrees. Oh, sorry. If, when they're lined up, th that's the first one here. It's just simply the verticals line up. So it's plus one, and the horizontals are in opposite directions. So it's minus one. So that's actually the channel matrix for a point-to-point -point link with dual polarized antennas. If you re rotate the far end, now you've got portions of what's being transmitted in both of the receiver paths. So graphically, it looks like this. So there's your transmitter with vertical and horizontal. And on the receiver, the vertical is made up of a, of a horizontal chunk and a, and a vertical chunk. Okay, so it gets split on the receiver antenna. But you can actually do some interesting math. This is, in fact, how FM radio works. Um, you, those are vectors, okay? These, are not, these things have direction, they have amplitude, and they have phase. So you can actually now, you can combine these in clever ways and actually recover the two original signals. So I'm showing you here that the vertical transmit is actually a combination of what's received on those two ports. If you add them together, the red lines reinforce and the purple cancel. So you just recovered the vertical signal. And on the horizontal side, you subtract them. So now the reds cancel and the purples reinforce. So there you go. That's why you can have a, the far end rotated completely at 45 degrees, and you've got complete contamination of vertical onto horizontal and horizontal onto vertical, but the system does the math and pulls them back out again. Right? So that's actually a really, that, that's something you can get your head around, I hope, 
Um, but that's basically how this works. What happens if it's rotated 90 degrees? If it's rotated 90 degrees, then you're back to a horizontal vertical case again, right? The two streams just. The vertical is now being received on the horizontal. Yeah, but the, the, the system doesn't care, okay. right? Because it's just two data streams that it's transmitting and receiving. I'm using zero and one. It's arbitrary. Okay. Right? It, it puts them back together. It has the math to, to, right, to, right. to turn them back around. Okay, now, this is the case that everybody's used to. This is how most people think about this. AP on the bottom, client on the top, a single stream, has got one antenna on it. Okay, so what do you expect this thing to do? Well, you expect it to do this. You get this lovely pattern, which is ever so slightly tilted to the right, and it peaks up the signal at the client. And this is what leads most people to think that this is all about making pretty patterns and steering them around. Not right. Let's put a reflector in there now. Sorry about the line, I didn't get my animation straight. You'll see it in a second here. So there's the, my access point in the bottom, client's on the top. There's the direct path, okay, which is what we had before. Well, let's put some reflectors, reflections in there now. Now what do you think the ideal antenna pattern is? Okay, we had a beautiful antenna pattern before with a nice big lobe on it. That's what you want. Okay, that ain't pretty. And get, just wait a minute, it gets worse. Um, so, so what's actually happening here is that antenna pattern I superimposed on the bottom there, you can actually see there's a direct path. It's obviously rating in that direction. You have bounces off the side. They're being taken advantage of here. And in this model, I've only encountered, included this, the first bounce, because you can actually get additional bounces as well that go off the sides a few times. So now your ideal antenna pattern is what I'm showing here. That ain't pretty anymore. But what that does is it, actually, it truly peaks up the signal at the client because all three of those things combine in phase directly at that point. Okay, no guessing, no estimates built up, it just is. This is what multi-stream looks like. Each stream has its own antenna pattern. Okay, that's pretty significant. And I hope that's, that makes sense to you guys. Because I have to create three different combinations to isolate the three streams at the client. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you what that looks like in, in the, going back to the field plot. So here I've just isolated stream three, remembering that stream three is now being transmitted across all three antennas with different amplitude and phases. This is what those things look like individually, but remember, these are vectors. So if I add them together, something really interesting happens. That black line, hopefully everybody can see this, this is stream three, it peaks up under antenna three on the client, and stream one and stream two are zero. Our antenna one and antenna two are zeroed out. Okay, you guys know where I'm going with this? That's how multi-user MIMO works. Okay? Because the client doesn't have the ability, if it doesn't only really has one antenna, it doesn't have the ability to do any sort of math to cancel out the other, the other chains. The AP has to do that work. So when it transmits into the channel, it already has to create the situation where the other two streams are nulled out under the, under the, other, under, under the other access points or the other client devices. Okay, so, and here's stream one and stream two as well. You can see that they're, e they're each uniquely peaked up under one antenna. And Chuck and I have actually seen this in the field. You actually get situations where um, your SNR may actually appear to decrease, but your throughput is better. Because the, AP, the client doesn't have to do as much work to decode the signal. Now, one more important thing. This is, I'm not gonna talk about this chart extensively, aside from the fact that there's lots and lots of tones in an 80 megahertz channel. Okay, the other thing that's really interesting about this is the antenna patterns are actually different from the bottom of the channel to the top of the channel. Now, in an ideal world, and this isn't actually how it's done, you could have an individual antenna pattern for every single tone. Now, that's mathematically expensive, so what they do is they tend to group them, so, because the two that are adjacent aren't gonna change very much. So here's an example here showing an 80 megahertz channel. This is uh, one of the streams, and this is the pattern at 5460, 5500, and 5540. The antenna patterns are different, all right? Now, you can't do that with an analog system. You have to do this with a baseband solution. You have to do this with beamforming. And if you've got something that's impairing the ability to create these antenna patterns, you're not gonna get maximum performance out of your system. So that means generally, there's a couple of rules that, that I like to articulate when you're talking about MIMO operation in general and 11AC, beam for, 11AC and, and multi-user MIMO specifically. You want very, very simple antenna patterns. They must match, 
You can't have them shooting off at 60 degrees to each other. That just does not work. Because if they're shooting in different directions, you can't cancel. Okay? So you actually want very, very simple antennas. You want them to, you want them to have uniform antenna patterns. And you want the, the antenna patterns to be the same. They can be different polarizations, but the power characteristics should be the same. And that's, we'll give, that will give you the optimal performance. Now, having said all that, beamforming, because it's so powerful, it will optimize any antenna system you have attached. But if you want the, be the best bang for your buck, you want to make sure that you meet those criteria. Sim uh, similar antenna patterns uh, that don't impair the ability of the system to do this. So when you're indoors doing this type of thing, that means that either you're using simple omnis, or if you're using a directional antenna on the wall, it needs to be fat. Right, so that you're engaging all of the reflections in this room. You want to take advantage of those. Without reflections, you reduce the degrees of freedom and you reduce the ability to support MIMO. Forget about 11 AC beamforming or multi-user MIMO. MIMO is impaired if you use a, an overly directional antenna inside. All right, now, multi-user MIMO. So there's the same math again, except now, instead of those three antennas on the right-hand side being attached to one client, they're attached to three different clients. All right, so what you get, and this is the part of the reason why this was done separately, why it's part of the wave two stuff that's going on with 11AC, is this is extra math, and it's extra processing, and they needed more silicon area to accompany, accompany this, so we had to get to the next generation of silicon geometries to allow this math to be shoved into the machine. And there's more overhead here, right? Because now you need to be sending sounding packets to each one of the client devices uh, in order to establish the locations, and they need to individually send back. But they're only sending back one row of this matrix. Okay? So, so the AP has to construct those inputs from each one of the clients and actually build the composite matrix so that it peaks up stream one under antenna one, stream two on antenna two, and stream three under antenna three. Okay? And before I showed you the three, the three client devices are very close together, now we can space it out. This space here I'm showing, by the way, is 40 wavelengths. So that's what that means. So 40 wavelengths at five gigs, about uh, two meters or so. So still not a very big space, but I can, I can assure you that this extends over the entirety of this room, for example. That type of variation in the signal strength is everywhere. So this is just showing what happens when the antennas are radiating omni. Okay, so here's the pattern for stream one. Okay, and you can see it's peaked up under the blue dot there. Nice pattern, huh? And this is, by the way, not a hallway. This is now a, a six-sided room, floor, ceiling, and four walls. So th this includes all the reflection sources in that space. All right, so you get that one peaked up. There's stream two. You can see that the, the blue and the green are nulled out. And there's stream three. In that case, the blue and the red are nulled out. That is multi-user MIMO. And all of the things I told you about making sure that you've got the right antenna solutions attached apply. Because if you are impairing now, here's a simple case. If your users are not all in one side, and you're using a directional antenna, how do you get to the guy behind you? Right? Pretty simple. But this, this math always works, independent of where the clients are. The other really important thing about this, too, is you don't create any hidden node issues here. I don't know if anybody noticed that. This thing's radiating properly. CSMA still works. Right? It doesn't impair the operation of the system. You, there's, no, there's no APs that are going, oh, gee, I'm not seeing any transitions. I'm just going to blast away. That's not going to happen here. So, so third-party devices, which may be, trans, may be socially uh, un, unsocial or antisocial devices, I think that was the term, um, they will hear the CSMA signal. They will know not to transmit. Okay? Because I am actually broadcasting 360 degrees, but I'm using the math to accomplish this result only where the clients are. Okay, so if I did this on a two-dimensional plot, you would see a hole here, a hole here, and a hole here. All right, so that's, that's how this works. Is that making sense, guys? Okay, cool. How often do you have to settle sounding frames to account for the fact that clients are moving around? So, so as I said, it's sent, for, it's, for, it's sent 40 times a second, every, every 25 milliseconds, right? And so that... I don't remember what the exact number is, Peter, but it's not a high velocity. It's, it's, it's meant to be sort of a, a, a slowed or moderate walking speed. I think it's like, it's, it's like one kilometer an hour or something or, or something like that. It's a small number. So yeah, it does have to be sent fairly often in order to keep track. The, the other question that's come up about this is, is, is free stream, well, I guess you could actually be transmitting the free streams in three different MCS, right? You could conceivably, I don't think the standard allows for that right now. 
I'm looking at Peter back there. It's it's all it's all a single MCS rate to the three clients, right? Do you know Peter? Okay. I mean, if that's true, then right, don't, don't the clients kind of necessarily, in some sense, they have to be spatially separated, but also the same distance away from the access point. They have to have a similar ability to receive, yeah. Right. So yeah. They, they got to be able to receive. All three clients in this case have to receive the same MCS rate. At the same time. Correct. There, there is a, there is a, so. On the presumption that they can't, they have to use the same MCS rate. Then you'll have the, the characteristic you need. It's going to be the lowest common multiple. Now, having said, so, all of these clients are beam forms. So the ranges in an enterprise environment, particularly, the range is going to be out to the edge of your uh, cell coverage anyway, right? And as long as you're properly steering, back to Peter's lecture this morning, as long as you're making sure that your clients are attached to the right AP, this is going to work pretty well. Okay, and just a, a couple of couple of points. Um, uh, these, are, these were taken, actually Chuck did these measurements. Um, so just to show you how some of this stuff forms up in reality. So this is a really short distance on the left side here. That's five meters. So this is, we're getting a ground bounce in that region off of the, the antennas that are used with this. But you can see it pretty rapidly drops down to the two stream rates here. So we go from three streams on the left hand side uh, out to the two streams. The thing I find pretty cool about this, this is an unmodified MacBook Pro. The far right hand side of that is 600 meters. Okay, that's three eighths of a mile and we're pushing 185 megabits per second to that client device with beamforming enabled. So beamforming is a factor in the operation of these systems. It's real and it has a real impact. That Andrew? Just, uh, clean this is a clean environment, flat earth, client and AP can see each other, right? This is your starting point and it degrades from here. Fair enough. But beamforming will always deliver a benefit for you. But I just wanted to reinforce going back to what we were talking about, the channel model, once I get away from that place where I get this local ground bounce, it drops down to these two stream rates pretty quickly. Okay, and this is, this is a handset. So again, this is a, the S4 that supports beamforming. It's a single stream device. In this situation, we're getting at 300 meters, so um, that's uh, 75 megabits per second to a handset. All right, and this is a, a, directional, a directional solution. Again, taking advantage of the beam forming, right hand side, 300 megabits per second at 600 meters. Eric. Chuck? Sorry, softball question. Um, can you explain how a single stream device beam forms? How does a single stream device beam, beam form? Yeah. Well, let's go back to okay. the previous picture. I actually showed that case. So what a single stream device is doing is in, in, in an open environment, it's just combining the two antennas, right? And it's creating, it's gonna create a somewhat pretty pattern. And if you have H and V and the client's inclined at 45 degrees, it's gonna excite the two phases in phase and the client will then max up, right? It'll peak, it'll peak up the, the, the polarization at the client because it will be able to hear each of them and will be doing this transform and actually peaking up, because I told you outdoors we use orthogonally polarized antennas it will actually create the amplitude and phase between the polarizations to peak it up on the client. So if the client's rotating its position, yeah, it no, will I'm, actually rotate the polarization being transmitted. Sorry, I was referring to the client participating in the CSI process. So okay, so, the, right, so, so it's two-way. Yeah, okay, so, so what's going on there? Let's go back to our picture. Okay, so, so if you just ignore the other two clients, so we got one client there, which is Y1, it's gonna feed back just that single row. Um, there's actually, it's, it's, it's called it's, uh, decomposition. I can't remember exactly the math, but there's a way you can create an artificial transform uh, for a single client device. So if I only have two devices I'm transmitting to, it will create two antenna patterns. If I'm transmitting to three devices, it will create three antenna patterns. Okay, so, so this is actually done on a per client basis, but when you're doing all three of them, you have to peak, you have to solve the peaks and the zeros for all three clients at the same time. When you're only solving for one client, the only map outcome is just solving the peak. I hope that makes sense. Let's get into some of the detail. Okay. All right. So, so yeah, so this is, you know, so we're seeing real practical results here. Uh, as I said, this is a directional solution using six and a half, six and a half dBi gain antennas. Uh, at that far right hand side there, that's now 300 megabits per second at 600 meters. And this is, uh, this is taken in a different circumstance, so you can't directly look at this, but this is the, uh, again, the S4. 
um, the solid green line and the solid blue line are beam forming off and beam forming on. I'm assuming from that matrix before that again, like a two stream client, a couple one stream clients, then we'll be filling in two rows of Correct. Those. Absolutely right. Because it'll feed back two, two rows of information right. back those, to the AP. points are, you know, next to each other within half a wavelength. Right? That's, that's exactly right. And, and so when you have a two stream client, there's only one sounding packet sent to it, and then it would be. So rows, each, two each but two, two rows come back, exactly. So the number of rows and the amount of information fed back and the amount of information collected is dependent on the client capability. Right? The client will know that it's a two-stream device and what it has to do to respond. So is there a concern about overhead of now adding you know, 40 packets a second? To, yep. To, to, you know. And back to the earlier thing that Chuck was talking about, that's when you crank up your data rates and you make sure you minimize your air occupancy time. Um, you, could also, you could also combine them with beacon frames and such too. No, they're, they're individual packets. They, they this, is, this is a discrete process because it's a unicast process. It goes to a particular client and you get a response back from the client. Uh, okay. So there is an overhead associated with this. It's not, it's the, not, overhead, the overhead increases linearly as a function of how many clients you have. Absolutely. Okay, but I will take a 1% trade-off. If you just leave it at base rates, it, it's like a beacon. It could be a 1% consumption. Right. But I get a 15% return on throughput. I'll take that trade every day of the week. And with multi-user MIMO, practically speaking, in the lab now, because we we're, we're getting pretty far along with our product, we're seeing about a, a two and a half times improvement with three clients. So over net, net throughput. So that's pretty profound. Two, two and a half, oh, for, for So ideally you'd get three, right. but there's some implementation margin there, so we're getting about a factor of two and a half throughput on the downlink. Okay. Will it be, be, be the high density? Nope. Because Chuck was mentioning body loss this morning, right? Because of that body loss, there's no way for additional paths to form to the client. Or if there are, they're gonna be attenuated pretty significantly. So this isn't gonna really help high density. What it's going to do is gonna help enterprise significantly, it's gonna help moderate density areas. Um, but in very, very high density solutions, they're still gonna be engineered and you're still gonna to have to do all of the things that Chuck talked about for the, for the 49ers. In wave two, it's gonna be by standard, so the high density area probably makes sense to it doesn't matter. The, the system will work it out whether or not it should be doing it. But the sounds, the bad packets look sounding like it's... Uh, no, fair, fair enough. Um, so, so it's not something we're planning on doing right now, but it's, you're right. If we know that there's environments where this shouldn't be turned on, then yeah, we could probably provide that capability. But right now we're not planning on doing that. Yep. Has this picture changed at all when um, you're varying your packet sizes? The picture change at all when you're varying so, your... No. Yeah, so when you're... I mean, I imagine that you're running, you know, not just that test, you're doing some delay, adding some noise, things along those lines, and still trying to watch the curves, right? Yep. So, um, you know, as you're starting to get, like, a lot of small packets or something like that, does that picture change a lot? No, because this is a... This is a, a um, so, so, okay, so this is just an iPerf test. Yeah. Um, so the plots I'm showing you here, is that what you're asking about with the plots? Or you're talking about specifically about the beam forming process? Well, I'm just kind of curious. So, you know, I'm trying to map this clean room stuff to what happens in the real world. And, you know, I, you see various packet sizes on a network, right? Well, just sure. Like really large ones, you see really small ones, you know, and you're trying to do throughput tests. So I'm kind of curious as to how that maps to what that looks like in, in the Sure. Room. So, so this is going to be like anything else. It's going to be subject to, to the vagaries of, of real life Wi-Fi, right? So rate adaption applies, collisions apply, right? So, so it put, this is on the upper left-hand side of Chuck's curves from his first presentation, right? So small packets, lots and lots of contention, it's gonna to tend to, to, take, to take the overall throughput down. Your control frames are gonna to continue to increase. All of that stuff doesn't change. But what this is doing is taking your physical layer and taking it up a notch, and then you're starting at a higher level before you come down. I, I hope that kind of makes sense. Because this is a physical layer phenomenon, right? This, is not, this doesn't affect your packet flows. Aside from the protocol overhead, this, this always provides a benefit. And it's really cool because not only, the, and this is really the important thing, is not only is it increasing the signal strength of the client, it's actually maximizing the MIMO operation of that channel for the given antennas. Whatever antennas you attach, as I said, simple is better, but whatever antennas you attach, this, this, this will always work to try to maximize the antenna subsystem you're attached to. So the antennas are matched. Yeah, but but so but you could have th you know three you could have three antennas which were directional panels and spaced by eight meters apart, which seems like an insane thing to do. But you could feasibly do that, and the beam forming would still apply, and it would actually try to create patterns from the from those widely separated antennas to peak up the individual streams of the individual clients. 
it's kind of hard, kind of mind-boggling to think about, but that's, originally these systems were meant for antennas that were widely separated because MIMO was originally defined for cellular. And cellular base station antennas are spaced by at least 10 wavelengths, which 800 megahertz is 10 feet, right? So, so you know, all this stuff, this isn't, by the way, the MIMO portion of this is not, or sorry, the, yeah, the MIMO portion is not new, right? That was invented by AT&T Labs. That was the BLAST technology. Jack Winters was the progenitor of that. So none of this stuff is really new. It's all about, as I was talking about, about getting the silicon area to get all of this stuff crammed in there and, and processing it in real time. Yep. Yeah, matrices are expensive math, right? So it takes, it takes a lot of silicon area to do that. So I hope that was uh, interesting. Um, I, I, I try to add to this presentation every time I do it, um, and so that the multi-user MIMO was the latest piece, and hopefully at some point I'm gonna actually do a two-dimensional plot, and it's just it's gonna take my computer a long time to do that calculation. So thanks very much, guys, and uh, appreciate your time.